Hey, stranger. Long time no see. Yeah, but you're still creepy. Two friends, two pastors, two theologians, pursuing spiritual life by exploring the scriptures in conversation with the fathers. I'm Dr. Wes Arblaster. And I'm Dr. Ethan Smith. And we are Mysterion. Hey, welcome back. Mysterion is returning. Yeah, we are back. It's been a while. It's been months and... uh, Longer than we thought it would be. Longer than we thought it would be. But... It was because of COVID that we had to shut down some operations, and you're like and this, in your 80s. This is like a massive operation, you know? <laughs> massive. <laughs> Whole wings well, of the mystery. I mean, it's not just what you see <laughs> Industry here. Industry had to get shut down. I mean, down. it's not just what people see. There's also John <laughs> sitting behind the camera, of course. It wouldn't be Mysterion otherwise. <laughs> oh, man. But it's but, good to have. It's good It's good to be back, right? And we want to thank you guys because people kept listening and subscribing and sending videos to other people, and even we, while we were doing nothing. Yeah, that's right. And that's my favorite kind of success when i do nothing and something happens exactly (laughs) we reached a milestone actually today 500 subscribers on youtube on youtube just youtube just youtube like uh not even podcast podcast platform i have no idea how to check right i'd have to ask john so so mysterion is becoming huge huge (laughs) we're we're getting rich (laughs) we're getting rich it's unbelievable we were talking around the dinner table the other night and the kids were saying you know you hit get so many subscribers and then you get some kind of button or something like that and i'm like well how many subscribers do you need and i think they said a hundred thousand and i said well we are 0.5 percent (laughs) uh toward our goal there yeah so i mean we've only been at it for (laughs) two years <laughs> a, th- a thousand yeah. to monetize 500 yeah. more people yeah. you get to subscribe so guys. reach out to your friends y'all you know we're in it for the money yeah. <laughs> money yeah. money would tear us apart though because would, i mean would. you remember back in the early days wes set up for some merchandise to be sold like the the mugs that i broke and it was months and months later that wes told us we actually had a budget and it was like yeah and that twenty dollars is still sitting there. We haven't done anything with it. So uh, I, I, f- to... I feel like the money would tear us apart. We're <laughs> too... Anyway, what we're doing this season is we want to get super practical, but also kind of nerdy, which is what we do. It is what because we do. a lot of people have said to us, you know, one of the uh, one of the central claims of Mysterion, uh, and maybe some of the ways it differs from other theological podcasts, is the focus on this idea that all of Scripture, every page. Every word, every letter has Christ underneath it, Christ in you. And people say, hey, that's great. It's cool. We like the episodes. But how exactly am I supposed to do that? There are parts of Scripture where I have no idea. And so we want to address that some this season. Yeah, and you know we're going to get to some some particular scriptures that maybe people have wrestled with in the past, and um, you know how do we read Old Testament passages in certain ways, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but before we do that, we what we really think would be best to do is just spend some time sitting at the feet of somebody who is extremely important for the history of biblical interpretation, mm-hmm. someone who was wholeheartedly convinced that Christ. In, is in fact can be encountered on every page of scripture and um somebody who honestly uh has a kind of a controversial um legacy within the church um and if we can sit at his feet learn a little bit about how he approached scripture mm-hmm. maybe we'll be able to get some building blocks yeah for how we approach this scripture. guy origin of alexandra alexandria as you'll see if you don't know who he is massively influential and also almost as equally massively controversial now those of you who listen who who are into theology you listen to other podcasts you know he's kind of a guy who's up for discussion for questions about salvation right now not so much scripture which is what we're going to do and for those of you who don't know we're going to tell you a little bit today introduce you to this super interesting character i promise you he'll be interesting and also if you stick with us through the season he he's going to have a lot to give you as far as your own encounter with christ through the scriptures yeah so those who have heard of origin i want to recognize that you know some of us have never heard of origin before but those of us who have typically what we hear when we hear anything about origin are some really strange stories rather right? strange rather strange rumors about origin so there's a few things if people have ever encountered origin one of the things that people hear is oh that's the guy who castrated himself right yes folks that's where the season starts <laughs> and in the end we're going through the song of solomon so it ain't pg anymore 
<laughs> right. So there's that one. There's oh origin origin. He's the heretic, right? The heretic. So there's and there's the guy who introduced Greek philosophy. He didn't care about the Jewishness of the Bible. Yes, it's all Greek philosophy. He changes the Bible's meaning. Right. So Plato yeah, one of the and Aristotle. Is, uh, origin was kind of for for some they've argued that origin is the fall of christian interpretation of scripture right after origin everything gets everything really goes wrong for a little over a thousand years right but we'll, we'll cover that we're going to cover that but <clears throat> some of this other stuff we're just not going to cover but what you need to understand is this there's a lot of rumors that circulated throughout history about origin precisely because he was such an important character and a controversial one so he's mm -hmm. one of those people that I would say is a, uh, a divisive figure in many ways, even though his way of reading scripture became pretty standard for most of Christian yes. history. We'll talk about that, yeah. The figure himself was a divisive figure. Uh, figure. You either love Origen or you hate Origen. And mm -hmm. those who hated Origen um, liked to make up stories about him. And so, and some <laughs> like of those stories got castration. traction. Right. So anyway, we're, we, uh, I don't know. Do you want to say anything about those rumors or are we just going to Well, I just want to say, you know, real quickly, for those of you listening and who belong to our church, you, if you Google search origin, you're going to find some stuff come be like, whoa, pastors Wes and Ethan, <laughs> what <laughs> have they got into? <laughs> we haven't gotten into that. He didn't really say those things. That's not going to be our that, spiritual that, challenge that, for <laughs> next season. <laughs> no. Um, I, I promise. Like, uh, and there's other weird stuff we haven't talked about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of strange stories. Uh, strange stories. About. Like our focus is Christ, Trinity, so forth, spiritual life. Um, but let's just say this: <clears throat> whether you love him or hate him, typically he's represented as a massively brilliant, massively creative genius, intellectual. And some people like what he has to say, and some people don't like what he has to say. But true to Mysterion fashion. We see something a little different in this guy, don't we, Wes? Yeah, we do. I mean, one of the things that we need to understand is that besides if you get past all the controversy and all of the stories and the mudslinging and all of that, and you actually get into the literature of the fathers, which you find is throughout some of the greatest fathers in all of, in all of history regarded by the tradition – consider Origen to be a master and their own spiritual uh, spiritual guide, right? So, for example, um, uh, the Cappadocian fathers, and specifically uh, uh, Basil um, and Gregory Nazianzus, which are two great, gr one of great fathers. Gregory right? the theologian, right. he and John. Right? They, they actually spent time after about 10 years of education going on a retreat writing what's called the Philokalia, mm -hmm. um, which is basically a book where they just collected origin sayings um, because they cherished him so much they regarded him as kind of the father's father, right? Yeah, so. and if I can say a word about this, like some of you might be like, okay, Cappadocians, who cares? St. Basil, St. Gregory the theologian. <clears throat> this is important for, for this reason. Those, those guys and a few others around that time these are the guys who primarily gathered the texts together we call the New Testament and said this is scripture. It, when you are seeking spiritual life, you're seeking Christ, you're seeking the word of God, it's these books, not others. The very people whose judgment we trust every time we pick up a Bible and preach out of the New Testament, they considered this guy Origen their master for reading scripture. And also they championed the idea that the core of scripture is the lordship of Christ, his full divinity, that Jesus is God, is the Father is God, or the Trinity. All of these guys who are so influential about whether we know them or not, every time we read our scripture and we worship Father, Son, and Spirit, call Christ Lord, or acknowledge these books, the, the men who kind of won those arguments, made those determinations, for them, Origen was the master. Yes, and Origen, Origen was the master because Origen helped them see Christ in scripture. So exactly. That, that is, that I think that is crucial. It's not just like they're fanboys of Origen. Um, the point mm -hmm. is, is that Origen himself went into scripture in such a profound, I mean, this guy wrote over 2,000 teachings and commentaries and sermons um, on scripture, right? Mm -hmm. And of all of that work that he's done, right, the lion's share of it is just focused on understanding scripture, yep. understanding and finding Christ in scripture. And so he is a he is someone that I think we're going to learn a lot from as we dive into so maybe, this season. Maybe we should paint a picture of this guy, right? Who is this guy? Not just, oh, he's brilliant, he had these good ideas, but who is he? 
Wes, you got some you got some information for us, right? On who is this guy? Origin of yeah. Alexander. So 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 just to give some background um, and a kind of a general summary of Origin's life, <clears throat> Origin was born somewhere around 185. CE. So think about this. This was about 150 years after the death of Christ. Right? AD, you secular monster. AD, CE. So he was born in the city of Alexandria, which also is important. And it's important for a couple of reasons. One is Alexandria was a hub of the Greco Roman Empire. It's a big imperial city. Major city in Egypt. Major city in Egypt. There's lots of trade going on, there's a lot of different religious traditions represented in that city. It had a long um, standing Jewish community um, in Alexandria and the Christians themselves were established there for a, for for quite some time at this point in 185. The so, tradition is that Mark Mark founded the church, founded yeah, the church found, in, in Alexandria. Yeah. yeah. So Origen, Origen's born in Alexandria and he's born in this I will say a cosmopolitan um, context. Um, his dad was a bookseller. And so he grew up around books. Leonidas. Leonidas, yeah. And so um, he grew up with a love of books. Um, it's important to also recognize, though, that not only does he live in this, I would say, a very cultured environment, a very pluralistic environment, um, a very academic and intellectual environment, because Alexandria mm. had a great library there. It's kind of known as an intellectual center. You want to if you want to learn philosophy, if you want to learn uh, 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 Hellenic culture um, in that area of the world, you go to Alexandria. So he's in that kind of context. But not only that, but Alexandria is also a place during this period that experienced a lot of persecution of the Christians. So there were there were several. We have to remember that during this time, it wasn't as if persecutions were constant and ongoing, but persecutions by the Roman authorities broke out in several areas um, and had were, were, were fairly severe in Alexandria during, um, throughout um, various periods of um, Origen's life. In fact, one of those persecutions broke out while Origen was still a young man and it took the life of his father. His father was martyred. Yeah, and the story people often tell about Origen as a kid is his father kissing his chest because of the genius, the spirit of God in you know in his heart. But what you often don't tell is that when his when he's a teenager and his dad is martyred, killed for the faith, his mom had to hide his clothes from him so he wouldn't run out and get martyred himself as a teenager. Yes. So this is this is a lover of the gospel and of Christ. Right? Yes, yeah, so he's a passionate faith. Um, he grew up learning both the scriptures. He grew up as a Christian, but he also grew up with a strong Hellenic culture and education. And he early on taught um, uh, the classics to people who wanted a general um, Hellenic, uh, you know, education. By Hellenic, you mean like Greek, right? Yes. Homer, yes. Plato, these figures. But early on, when he was given the opportunity, he <clears throat> moved away from that. In fact, sold all of the books that he had to to begin um, a catechetical school, which is basically a school to teach people who are thinking about or are, are discerning whether they should become Christians mm -hmm. and want to be baptized. <clears throat> there was a process of education. His job was to teach people the Christian faith and lead them into the faith to become Christians. And this is, again, this is a this is in Alexandria, so there's lots of pagan beliefs, there's Jews, mm -hmm. there's Gnostics, there's all kinds of stuff going on in this in this period of time. And Origins it was given the task, he was, he was commissioned by or invited by the bishop, Bishop Demetrius, to be a teacher of this catechetical school at 18, which mm -hmm. he's young, right? Um, so he does, and he begins, and he's such a powerful teacher, he's such a, um, charismatic and influential and persuasive teacher that he starts converting pagans to Christianity and he starts to develop a reputation. He becomes kind of a celebrity mm -hmm. um, and you either loved him or you hated him, you know. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, uh, his, his students loved him fiercely, um, those who were against the Christian faith um, hated him. And those who became jealous of his influence and popularity also mm -hmm. um, hated him. So his life is filled with controversy. But what we want to talk about is a little bit about his career as a teacher. Right? Well, so we can get into this. So he's this teacher, fairly young teacher, and he's converting a lot of people. And he's drawing people, not just from Alexandria, but across the Roman Empire to learn from him when per another wave of persecution breaks out. Yes. Right. He's a young teacher. So it happened when he was a teenager. 
and his dad dies and he's you know kind of denied the chance to be a martyr himself but he's teaching he's gathering disciples he's getting a reputation and a, a, a particularly brutal persecution wakes breaks out and most church leaders leave alexandria but young origin keeps teaching classes on the very thing that could get him and his students killed and people keep coming yes to him right yes so there's like there's two things there yes. right again his dedication to to ministry to teaching the word yes and secondly like this guy's got something yeah he's br- he's a brilliant man and so you know he's he's got the um intelligence to you know debate with any any anyone who comes from any other tradition mm-hmm. or any perspective but people are mostly drawn to him because of his way of life his character mm-hmm. uh, i have a couple of quotes here i want to read um about his ascetic discipline that thing is the manner in which he strove personally to embody the way of christ and took on the ascetic lifestyle this is from eusebius is a famous uh, church historian writing about Origen. He says that Origen lived with extreme simplicity, owning only one coat, walking barefoot, sleeping on the floor, eating only what was necessary to support his life, and after a long day's work, sitting up half the night studying the scriptures. So you you, you start to get this understanding. This guy basically sells all of his all of his goods, everything he has that's valuable, all of his works, in order to teach other Christians, and then he gives his entire life to the study of scriptures such that he's he's eating as little as possible, um, staying up as late as possible to study with his students, to read, to understand the scriptures. Um, so he says that uh, he continues on, he, pers- he persevered, um, disciplining himself by fasting, measuring out time for sleep, which he was careful to take never on a couch, but on the floor, and indicated the gospel ought to be kept, which exhorts us not to provide two quote uh, not to provide two coats, nor to use shoes, nor indeed to be worn out with thoughts about the future. The point that that's a that's a loose quote of the the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes mm-hmm. of Jesus, right? So, so the thing is, like, <clears throat> for, for those sometimes who don't like Origen, they, they paint a picture of a guy who what he really loved was Greek philosophy, but he was a Christian, so he just have found fancy ways to make the Christian scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, say what Greek philosophy taught. And, you know, it's pretty obvious this is what he's doing. The problem with that picture, of course, is like that kind of devotion to Scripture would not be there. That kind of devotion to the spiritual life. Like he clearly did not want to be distracted by the pleasures and goods of this world. He'd rather taste the pleasures and goods of Christ's life. So he lived in this rather extreme way, not wanting to be comforted in this world, but in the kingdom, right? Yes, yes. And it also and it also gets to the point that I think we want to get to here um, regarding this season. So we've called the season bread and fire because what we're going to find is Origen's going to teach us that Scripture itself is like bread, spiritual bread, and it's like fire. Mm. He pursues Scripture not just because he's an intellectual, not just because he's curious about understanding what it means. He's going to Scripture because he believes that the Word of God is the bread of life. Mm. And he wants to break that bread open and wants to digest and be nourished spiritually by that bread. And he also believes that Scripture is like a spiritual fire that is to cleanse and to purify us so that we share in the life of God, the mm-hmm. Spirit of God, the fire of God in that way. So it is a spiritual endeavor. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just a an intellectual one. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that, that that's also to try to, to try to paint this picture of a man who's passionate about Scripture, not just because he's an intellectual, but because he believes that life is found there, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that's why he's teaching others. That's why he's putting his own life at risk. Um, and that's something else I want to talk about a little bit. So he's teaching his students in Alexander. He's gathering these students around studying the Scriptures. Um, but the school is also a school where, um, because of these persecutions are happening, um, to belong to the school, to participate in the school, is to put your life at risk, mm-hmm. because you could be martyred because you're known as a Christian. And um, um, Origen, Origen watched several of those uh, pagans that converted to Christianity and became his students. He actually watched them go to martyrdom. And, and there, um, Eusebius records that, I'm gonna read this again, he would go to his students in prison, stay by them when they were tried, and even when they were being led to death, Often he went up um, with the martyrs 
and unconcernedly saluted them with a kiss, regardless of the consequences. The pagan crowd standing became very angry and would have rushed upon him and nearly made an end of him if they were mm -hmm. able. So we have this picture of a man who was deeply in love with his students as well, recognized that the risk that, they, that uh, they were putting themselves in by studying the scriptures and then walking with them through um, even unto even unto death, a yes. martyr, and he would himself <clears throat> eventually suffer as mm -hmm. well. But it's I mean, it's such a touching picture. As somebody who's done so much teaching in my adult life, like you spend weeks, months, or then years in this case, right, uh, teaching people. You you come to have a kind of parental love. There's there can be a sweetness there, and the idea of of forming these young people and then having to kiss them on the head as they march off to be killed for the faith. And that that's just such a drastically different picture than what you're used to. Like this this is a a compelling figure with a heart as big as his brain, right? Mm. And uh, deep, deep devotion to the gospel and to his students and uh, <clears throat> it's just it's compelling, right? right. Compelling. Um, just just a kind of quick touch on a few few other things about his life before we get into some of the significance um, um, he, eventually he was exiled with some of his students um, from Alexandria and uh, most most understand this to be because the bishop that was in charge Demetrius uh, uh, was jealous of his popularity um, the scholar uh, contemporary scholar John Bear calls Origen the first international theological rock star <laughs> I mean this guy he actually traveled was invited around the world to give lectures to famous political uh, personages so um, this guy has got a lot of influence he's got a lot of popularity and uh, most see Demetrius as basically wanting to get rid of him. So it, what's interesting about it is even though he is forced to leave Alexandria, he goes and relocates in uh, Caesarea F Palestine. Um, um, even though he does that, I have here a quote about his response to this. I mean, imagine <clears throat> being in such a place where you're forced to leave, forced to relocate, forced to start your life again. Not only that, at a place that you would poured yourself into with all of that labor of teaching. And, right, right, right. Um, in a letter that he writes to Rufinus, who is uh, uh, one of his uh, students, he, he, uh, he says this, the leaders of my people have not known me. Oh, he's quoting Jeremiah here. So he's saying basically that Demetrius and some of these other officials that forced this to happen didn't really understand what, what he was about, what he was doing. So he quotes Jeremiah, the leaders of my people have not known me. They are foolish and senseless children. They are ready to do evil, but know not how to do good. That's a quote from Jeremiah. And he says, such men deserve pity rather than hate, and we must pray for them rather than curse them. For we have been created not to curse, but to bless. Mm. So what we find there, even even there, even as being forced to uproot and you know um, and relocate um, to another area of the world, right? Um, he's encouraging his students not to curse, not to hate, yeah. right? But to bless, <clears throat> bless, bless. And how enemies. hard that would be when it's it, you know it's one thing maybe you can do that with people who are considered enemies, but people who should be your brothers in the church, right? And uh, they do this to you, and even then. You know, they say civil wars can be the most bitter, but 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 even then, those things being done to him, and he he's so devoted to the way of Christ, the teaching of Christ, he he will not curse them, and he will not model cursing them mm -hmm. for his students. Right? right? He wants to ensure these 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 little ones in his care, so to speak, little ones who might give their their lives for the gospel, that they will also hold their tongues appropriately. Like right. just a profound commitment. Right. Profound commitment. So he re relocates to Caesarea. Um, Palestine and starts a new school with the blessing of the local uh, bishop there and um, continues his his work on the scriptures and um, throughout his life there <clears throat> he wrote many 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 things many works uh, most of which we don't have um, we only have a few selection of uh, works that are still in existence but there's two things that he really worked on um, throughout his life um, that were really significant works that were never finished um, one is the commentary on John, which we're going to spend a little bit of time diving into this, mm -hmm. and the other is the this the what's called the Hexapla, which is basically this work of translation that he sought to uh, um, produce. Um, most Christians at this time weren't couldn't read Hebrew, right? right. They were 
they were Greeks, and so they read the Greek scriptures. And often in conversations with Jews, they would get in interpretation um, debates with them about the meaning of the scriptures, and the Christians were at a disadvantage because they didn't know Hebrew. So Origen applied himself to the knowledge of Hebrew, to learn Hebrew, and he learned Hebrew thoroughly. And then he began to produce this translation, which included the Hebrew text, and then um, a Greek rendering of the Hebrew text in the second column, mm -hmm. um, and then four more columns of various Greek translations of mm -hmm. um, the Hebrew. That hexapla just means sixfold thing. Right. So there were six columns, one Hebrew, and then five different Greek versions, um, so that others would be able to, one, understand and read <clears throat> um, the Greek in relationship to the Hebrew. Now, that text was eventually lost, um, but it's a massive work. I mean, imagine trying to produce a work of the Old Testament, all those books that included six different, we'll call them versions, mm -hmm. of the text. I mean, it's a huge endeavor. Mm -hmm. It's a huge endeavor he's seeking to accomplish. Um, and then, again, like I said, the second one was uh, the Commentary of John, which was, which was also huge. Mm -hmm. um, he, he wrote 32 books um, and only got to chapter 13 of the Gospel of John. So you can imagine um, this guy, how thorough um, and in-depth his uh, reading of John is. So. Anyway, he continued his work there. He was eventually, there was a, 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 another persecution that broke out in Caesarea Palestine. He was, he was, he was um, imprisoned and tortured and eventually died as a result of that um, and is considered by and large as a martyr um, even though he didn't lose his life directly at the hands of his persecutors, his his punishment, his treatment um, resulted in the loss of his life. So he's considered a martyr. So that's uh, <clears throat> the two things I really want to point out here about his life is one, this is a man who is passionately um, pursuing knowledge of the scriptures and passionate about the gospel of Christ and that those two things are not separate for him. This is his life formed by a single desire and a single love. Mm. So, And I think that that's gonna be important for us because we're gonna find that the two are required to interpret scripture, if we're gonna learn from origin, origin to interpret scripture well, we have to in some sense embody the life of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So uh, so Wes said rightly there, starting uh, our next session uh, next week, we will be beginning to go through his commentary on John, and we're going to spend some time in there. And I do believe if you stick with us, you'll not just learn cool stuff about origin, but you'll actually be taught how to go into the Gospel of John and find Christ in there. Not just information about Christ, but Christ himself in there. And then we're going to turn to the Song of Songs. He's got a profound commentary on the Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, you know, this book. Um, and we'll go there because a lot of people have talked to us about like, well, how exactly do I find Christ in all these Old Testament passages? So we're going to let him first guide us through a gospel for a while and then make that switch. Now, I want to do something. I'm going to try to be as quick as possible about it. A little bit nerdy about uh, Origen's, uh, his influence and his significance because he is considered by many either famously or infamously to be the most influential reader or interpreter of scripture in the history of the church, right? Yeah, so I did his life, you're doing his legacy. His legacy. So we understand the way in which Origen shaped our reading And I'm going to particularly focus on the reading of scripture because that's really where it is. I mean, there, there, there are controversies about whether or not he taught certain doctrines and whether or not they were condemned. That's not going to be our focus so much today as this. So I, I want to talk a bit about, because what he's known for mostly and his influence are not his ideas so much as his the way he approached the scriptures. Um, and I want to start with the Apostle Paul and just remind our listeners of things that we like to talk about. You know, in the Apostle Paul, there's this parallel between the human being who's engaged in, in a spiritual formation and the scriptures themselves. Um, the scriptures, Paul liked to talk about the letter or the literal and the spirit, right? Which uh, sometimes demands, Paul himself will say, allegorical readings of scripture, spiritual readings, so that it all points to Christ or Christ in the church or Christ in the soul. And so there's this parallel in Paul where when you read the scripture, scripture has this flesh, this letter, and spirit. Both are important, but the point is to get to spirit because that's where Christ is pointed out to. So you see this modeled in the New Testament, this idea that 
what is on the surface of Scripture is good and important, but just like the body or the flesh of a human being, there's something deeper and more significant within the spirit. And so that's Paul. And so he has this parallel between the letter and spirit of Scripture and the, you know, the flesh and spirit of a human being. Origen comes along, you know, not that much later, about 100 years, a little more. And he says, what he does is he takes this notion of the human being we talk about so much here on Mysterion, like there's body and there's soul and there's spirit or heart. And for origin, he says, yes, that's what a human being is made of. There's these three layers of our reality, of our existence. And scripture too has a body, a soul, and a spirit about it. Now, that's not just a cool parallel for him. For him, Scripture is actually the life of Christ in words, right? Jesus of Nazareth, this perfect marriage of human and God, who lives this human life of body, soul, and spirit, is expressed in Scripture. And because the Scriptures are kind of an incarnation of Christ, they have these three layers of body, soul, and spirit that, that partakes in the life of God. Now, body just means what a text clearly means. You're reading Exodus. You're, you know, it's the story about Moses and leading people through the wilderness. If you're reading the Song of Songs, it's this love story about, you know, maybe Solomon or whoever and his lover. And then there's soul, which typically is like finding a moral in the story, right? This is focused on like like purging, like uprooting passions and sin. And then the third layer is spirit. And spirit has to do with the revelation of Christ, whether at the end of history or in one's heart or in the heart of the church or in the gospel, Christ. So he's got these three layers. Now, what he doesn't do, which he's often represented as doing, is saying, well, this is his method. In every passage, you'll find all three things, and you go in and you find right. What he's doing is stepping back and saying, whoa, when we search for Christ in Scripture, we tend to find these three kinds of things there. And any given passage could have 10 meanings, but they happen at these three levels. Some scriptures don't have that, that level of the body, that literal level. They just have spiritual levels. Um, so it's not a method. He's just sort of stepping back and saying, when we go looking for the buried treasure that is Christ in these words, we tend to find these three levels, right? The obvious meaning at the surface, which is its body, the moral lessons, which is its soul, but then that deep thing that we want, Christ, Jesus himself. Right. Um, yeah, and just, just, to, just to chime in here, I'd like to, uh, I would like to add that this isn't just some kind of strange, esoteric uh, view of Scripture. I mean, if you think about the way in which every Sunday a, a sermon or a homily is preached, it typically has these different layers, right? right. So when we listen to a message about, from the scriptures, it usually has, well, these are the characters. This is what's happening. Then there's, this is what we can learn from the characters, and this is what's happening. But we really hope that that's not where this, this sermon or the teaching ends. Mm -hmm. Like, ultimately, it gets down to, this is who Christ is, and this is this is what our what we are called into in our, in our life mm -hmm. with him. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I mean, Origins, quote unquote, method, which isn't a method, not his a way method. of approaching scripture is something that we do intuitively every time we preach or share or teach from the scriptures. That's right. And, and that's the really important thing. This is not something strange you don't know. This is something you do every time you go into scriptures devotionally. Every time your preacher takes a passage and preaches from it and there's some moral to the story and it leads you to Christ in some way, this is happening. The important thing here is this. In the modern church, what we tend to have is when you go off to seminary, if you train in scriptural education, you kind of learn that what you do in those sermons, that devotional reading is kind of not legitimate, right? There's a more historical way of reading things where Christ doesn't appear so much, and that's the real way. And we have to bend it to make it do work in a sermon. But for Origen, the, the intellectual reading and the, the, that pastoral or devotional reading, you cannot separate these. And in fact, uh, a reading that is not looking to share the life of Christ, to find that life of Christ in the text that the biblical writer shared in and that Origen shared in, that we're seeking to share in, is itself missing some things, right? Yeah, so just to say, I know you want to say a few things about this. For the theological theological geeks out there, you know, 
um, the way in which Origen interpreted scripture and the shaped so profoundly the way that Christians read scripture that this way of reading scripture was the way that Christians read scripture by and large for the next 1500 years then we have the 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 emergence of a different way of reading scripture which we call the either historical critical or critical method whatever it may be and at that point that older traditional way of reading scripture was kind of seen as that it was argued that this is illegitimate mm -hmm. it's it's ahistorical it's not intellectual it cannot be justified um and so origin becomes kind of considered the the guy who made the train go off the, yeah, the so, rails yeah right? i mean i, I want to get there uh, but just for a second this idea that you know origin immediately has fans and detractors but his manner of reading is so in keeping with what you actually see how new testament writers read the old testament that everybody adopts this frame and he's seen as a master at it just just one indication of this uh there was another guy theodore uh, mopsuestia and uh, theodore wrote a commentary on the song of songs uh and in it He's the first person, Jewish or Christian, that we ever have that doesn't read that story as having at least an allegorical level at which the glory of God, Christ for Christians, is seeking the church or Israel or the soul. And um, so Theodore says, no, 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 it's just Solomon's telling a story about some woman he's in love with from Egypt. Christ isn't in there. And um, the Second Council of Constantinople, this gathering of bishops, they got together. And what's interesting is they rejected that reading, but th their wording is significant because they say, Theodore's problem was that he kicked the Song of Songs out of the Bible. Well, Theodore doesn't actually say that anywhere. He just says mm -hmm. it doesn't apply to Christ. Mm -hmm. But for them, this idea that any, any, any text, any book that doesn't ultimately testify to Christ is not Scripture. In fact, that's what makes Scripture Scripture. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so even those in those councils, some of whom wouldn't like Origen, that that way of reading, that seeking at the deepest level, there's always going you're always going to find Christ. Universal, you know, Western Church. It was throughout the Middle Ages. Eastern Church in Egypt, the Coptic Church to this day, everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Um, at the time of the Reform, right, the the 1600s, uh, the reformers weren't weren't big fans of Origen, right? You had to, uh, Origen sees scripture as this treasure chest of like pulling more and more and more out and more of the life of God. And God is infinite, so there's more and more and more. In the heat of controversy between the reformers and the Catholics and the reformers and each other and uh, so forth, they wanted, there was this push to sort of narrow the focus, narrow the focus, right? There's gotta be one meaning and who has it right. Um, Although they still, Luther, Calvin, they did, they did spiritual readings of Scripture as well, as much as they hated Origen. Um, and then finally, as you said, you know, um, we get to the modern period and the arise, what's, what has arisen is called the historical critical method or modern biblical studies, which has a lot to say for it. We're both influenced by that. It's important. But uh, they really despised Origen and his method. So I've got a, a number of quotes here from when these, this modern way of reading arose, right? Uh, there was a guy who's actually a scholar of the fathers, a patristic scholar uh, named Hansen. Uh, and he says, basically, you know, Origen's method is a technique for emancipating or freeing the reader from the bondage to the text, right? It's uh, arbitrary, subjective, and anti-historical. He says, look, what Origen taught the church and the church ran off for on for 1500 years was a way of just freeing yourself from the, the text itself. In other words, to do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. Uh, which again, like, would would you give your life and the life of your loved ones for a book that you read in such a way that you just make it say whatever you want? Like, that's it's somewhat uh, hard to believe. Um, this same Hansen would go on to say, like, the guiding principle of modern biblical scholarship is the question of what any given text meant when it was first written or uttered for the first audience for which it was intended. In other words. Who wrote the Song of Solomon, and who did he write it to? If we were going to go back and ask them, Solomon, what did you mean by this? We got to guess at what his answer would be, and that's the right way to read it, or his first audience. But again, we don't know what they would say to those questions. That's, that's actually what a, a modern scholar is doing a historical theory about what people would say. So that sounds really great. 
Whereas for Origen, because he believes the writers of Scripture shared in the life of Christ, and because he struggled so deeply to share in the life of Christ, sure, you do the intellectual things, but if you're not pursuing the same experience of Christ that the biblical writers have, um, you might miss it. So Yeah, so if, if we're going to take some of what you said and kind of just simplify and distill it down, yeah. basically what we're saying is is that for Origen, the, the scriptures are holy because they're God's word to God's people. Right. Which means that the scriptures are written for me mm-hmm. as much as they are written for the first audience that received those scriptures. Now, that's very different than what we find today – is the biblical biblical critical way of approaching scripture tends to look at scripture first and foremost as a historical book. Mm-hmm. So scripture was produced way back when, written for people back then, and we need to understand what they believed about that scripture and then figure out how to apply that. Mm-hmm. To our context. And it, was, and it was beliefs. It was ideas. An yes. ancient person had some ideas that he wanted to communicate to other ancient persons. And what we need to do is to get back to those ideas. Right. Um, and uh, what Origen believes is that the scriptures give expression to a life shared with Christ. And they are put out for those in the church to receive that same life. Not ideas to be reconstructed or guessed at, right? Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the ways that we could kind of look at it is this. I think a lot of us tend to assume the Bible is sort of like this heavenly newspaper, mm-hmm. right? About events that happened a long time ago, and we can pick up that newspaper and we can learn all about all that about what happened a long time ago, um, and then figure out what do we do with it. Whereas Origen understood, yes, it does record events in the past. Mm-hmm. Those are significant. But most especially this, it is a the scripture is a living word addressed to us in the present. Mm-hmm. So whatever happens in the past or happened in the past is relevant. Absolutely. It's, it's important, but it's not the core. Right? Yes. It's it's not the spirit. It's not that deepest part of what mm-hmm. scripture is. The deepest the deepest core of scripture is eternally relevant. It is addressed to every moment, every age, right now. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're seeking. And I think that when we when we sit at Origin's feet, when we learn from Origin throughout the season, we're going to be learning about what does it mean to approach the scriptures and read the scriptures in such a way that they are, it is a living word addressed to us now. Right. Right. And, and, and what we can miss if, if we do that wrong, we can think this guy's going to help me find information about Jesus in the Song of Songs. Right. He's not going to help us do the special decoding that would find information about Christ. What he's going to show is how encountering Scripture, including the Song of Songs, can be an encounter with Christ, right? Yes. A living encounter, which is why he insists, yeah, you need, you know, he learned Hebrew and he did all these intellectual things, but you need to pray and you need to fast and you need to imitate the life of those who knew Christ because you're seeking to know Christ. You have to actually imitate the life of those who experience Jesus themselves in order to have that same experience. It's not a matter, when we talk about finding Christ in every page of scripture, it's not finding information about him everywhere. If you try to do that, you'll fail miserably. But let's think about the, the, the stories you told about him. This guy is fasting, this guy is praying, he's even seeking martyrdom. He's seeking to live the life Christ lived. He's seeking to live the life those who knew Christ lived to be in touch with him. He doesn't do that and read scripture. His reading of scripture was one and the same with those disciplines, right? To Mm -hmm. share in God's life, to wipe away his own life and have more of the life of Christ in him, as Paul would say. And so that's what he's seeking. That's that eternally relevant thing you're talking about, right? Is the experience of God in Christ in oneself. Yes, and I think think the important thing here is to recognize this, is this really changes the discussion um, if, if, Information and reading about Scripture, the historical, uh, the biblical project of trying to understand Scripture in its historical context, all of that is important, it's helpful, yes. it's insightful, but the, the, what he really does by, by, by saying that Scripture is this living word 
that we understand through sharing a life with Christ, what he does is he kind of levels the playing field in many ways. Mm -hmm. Because what we have is rather than the academics telling us what scripture means and having us only understand scripture through them, what we can begin to learn is that scripture is something that we can come to understand precisely by sharing a particular the same kind of life right as the apostles as the fathers as you know as right. what is represented in the church in this way and through that we come to receive the word not just like interesting information mm-hmm. but actually a living spoken word addressed to us yeah that's right and, and that's what he thinks like he he thinks that life of christ uh that we see in the gospels is alive and moving in all parts of scripture and in the lives of those who trained him and then in him right it's a matter of finding that one same life you know so we're, we're going to look at you can go online and find this origins commentary on the gospel of john we're going to look at book one next week just one thing he says, like when he does his preparatory remarks on what it would take to read the Gospel of John well, he doesn't say, well, you need to know your Greek or you need to know how context works. What he says, he says, you know, John had this special revelation because he is the one who rested his head upon Christ's breast, on his bosom. That's the life John lived. That's why John wrote the most, in his, his opinion, most profound gospel because of that intimacy. He says, if you want to read the Gospel of John well, you must also lay your head on the chest of Christ through prayer through fasting do these things that john did share his life of being close to christ and that's what will open the book up right yeah 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 so so we want to encourage you uh uh get online find the uh just type in origin and commentary on john and it'll pop up for free and if you want to read the first four or five paragraphs with us we're gonna we're gonna dive into some of that um next week and uh, i think it's going to be pretty pretty insightful now for some of you it, it'll be a challenge that won't be helpful you might not have time to get to it come back you don't have to have read it beforehand to to experience everything out of our podcast that you would want uh and remember our goal is not really to understand origin right. is to become better at accounting christ through opening the scriptures and that'll be our goal even if you got through the end of this episode you're like hey, origin i don't care we really do think he's going to be instructing us in ways and in patterns and in habits we can carry through our lives to read scripture in such a way that we could cultivate a more of a sense of Christ's presence. Yes. Good stuff. I'm excited for the season. I'm excited. I mean, and I'm excited to share some time with you, brother. I mean, of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you guys, would you please like and subscribe and share with your friends? Like, get the word out. I mean, I mean, gee, I mean, what other podcast out there is, I mean, Origin? There, hey, is there anything more exciting in the world hey, there are, right now? There are other podcasts. They're talking a lot about Origin, but not a lot of them are actually reading his commentary on Scripture. I don't know of any others. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't waste your time with the castration thing. It's... <laughs> There's not much insight there. <laughs> Let's just cut that off. It was right all there. a lie. It was made up by Jerome, right? So. Uh, not Jerome. No, no. I think it was Demetrius. You His think it was started by Demetrius? Yeah. Well, J- Jerome is the one that popularized it. Yeah. Well, Jerome. Jerome. He, yeah. We're not all right. Kidding. All right, <laughs> guys. See you next. See you week. next week. All right. Bye. Bye.